Capgemini. Uh, my name is Lenny Cohen. I'm the Capgemini uh, Global Chief Innovation Officer. And for that, in about $4.50, you can get a nice coffee at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be with everyone tonight. It's an honor to have you all here and join us. Um, I assume most of you know who Capgemini is. Most, yes? Pretty good? OK. So um, what you're sitting in now is one of two floors of our innovation hub here in New York. We just moved into this space last August, and uh, we're really excited about it. We house about five or six different Capgemini uh, entities or brands in this space. And this floor houses specifically Fahrenheit 212, an innovation strategy and design firm, and our Applied Innovation Exchange, who's your co-host of uh, tonight's event. Uh, so we're, again, we're very excited to have you with us. Uh, just by way of a very short introduction, a couple of my Applied Innovation Exchange colleagues are in the audience. I'll ask them to raise their hands. Uh, don't be bashful. And then the gentleman here, always with a beer in his hand, Bob Schwartz, he's our director here. So I would encourage you, uh, if you have any questions after the program tonight about you know, what we do at Capgemini or what we do around innovation, please reach out to any of my colleagues. I'll be happy to spend the time with you. Uh, this event, how many first timers for, an, yeah, for a What's Now event? OK, about a quarter of the room. So we began this program in San Francisco. Uh, now, in San Francisco, we're actually entering our third year. But we began this uh, a couple of years ago in San Francisco. Um, and we did it with a partner, a company called reInvent. And I'll introduce their, uh, their leader in just a minute. Uh, and what we did with these events in San Francisco, we find it, wanted to find a way to connect with the community uh, in the innovation ecosystem out in San Francisco that would be a little bit different. Obviously, it's a pretty crowded space out on the West Coast. So we wanted to do something different, something a little edgy, something that would be more about kind of some emerging topics, not just kind of the, the same old, same old, but some kind of you, know, you heard it here first kinds of things, and it was wildly successful in San Francisco, and as I said, we're in our third year now, we continue to do it. We have a program in San Francisco, actually two nights from tonight. Uh, and with that, when we opened up New York, we immediately said, you know, we want to replicate and bring what's now to New York as well. Uh, so we started the program at the end of last year, uh, and now we've been running strong in, in San Francisco, or in New York since. Uh, tonight, you're in for a real treat. David Edwards is with us, and, and this may very well be one of the most interesting and provocative uh, topics that we've had in What's Now, I think arguably uh, in a while. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear David's talk tonight. But uh, before we get David on stage, let me bring on uh, Pete Lydon. Pete's uh, uh, the founder and, and leader at reInvent. Pete's been our partner in this What's Now series since the beginning. Uh, Pete's a, obviously become a very good friend and a great business associate as well, uh, and he's our moderator for What's Now. So please give a warm welcome to Pete Lydon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lanny, and actually thanks for Camp Gemini. I mean, it's worth pointing out here, folks, that when we started this out over three years, well, kind of three years ago, uh, Captain, I took a real bet on this and said, hey, we're going to basically initiate this project with you. We're going to basically really sustain an, uh, this idea. We're going to actually figure out a way that we could systematically go through the innovation ecosystem and find really top innovators in different fields. We're going to find a way to bring together a kind of a cross-disciplinary network of people from these fields over time, uh, of which you are now part of it, and that we're going to basically open this up to people uh, for wider audiences through this media product that we do with my team at reInvent here, which you're seeing around here. So our side of Essential, so, so they've been fantastic partners. They started it, they've sustained it, and uh, they're actually expanding it to New York. So thanks a lot to Capgemini. Um, our part, for that matter, my part as uh, the founder of reInvent, is to go find the really cutting edge thinkers who are not just thinking big ideas, but actually doing really interesting things, applying their innovations. And so what we do is we find these folks in different fields, and then we also help kind of seed a network of which you're all a part here. And we're building this network in New York here now, so we're encouraging all the folks that are come here and really tap into it and really love what's happening here to be thinking of other people in your network who might be interested in this kind of invite-only, intimate kind of setting, kind of talk with really high-end innovators and uh, bring them into the fold, because that's how we're going to leverage the network and get a really interesting multidisciplinary network. Um, 
So as I'm out there looking around for all these interesting characters, I was up in Boston recently at a conference on radical wellness, in which it was all these biotech and genetic people, and it was very, really kind of um, elite kind of crew in this space. And that's why I ran into David Edwards. And David uh, fit the bill. Uh, because basically, I mean, I'm a pretty savvy guy about what's going on in technology and what's going on in basic science. But when I had a conversation with David, he just kind of totally blew my mind about all the things that are happening in the space around scent, around olfactory senses, essentially smells, and, uh, and also how these things are now being applied into real companies. And so he's a perfect, perfect fit, essentially, for this kind of conversation. And he has agreed to come down, and he's here from Boston. He's in and out of New York all the time to be talk about this. So, so David, one of the things that's interesting about this, just to tee it up here a minute, is you know who knew kind of thing. It was like that there's all kinds of breakthroughs and new kind of insights coming together now in around the kind of sense of smell, what scent does. There's this idea, you know, now that essentially 80% of what goes into a flavor essentially is really coming through your sense of scent, what you're smelling as opposed to literally tasting. Uh, all these scents now are affecting our emotions in ways that we're really having new understanding. So anyhow, there's a lot of cool ideas in the, in the science space, the idea space. But again, he is essentially an applied scientist in that he is uh, the entrepreneur, and he's actually the founding, no, or, or co-founding, no fewer than three companies coming out of this space. And he's essentially, at his job, which is, I would say, he's a professor at Harvard in the practice of idea translation in Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science. Science Applied, which is very much in the Applied Innovation Exchange here. Uh, and so he's, but he's rolling out these companies that are coming off his re leading research. And so what we're going to have today is to have him come out and kind of get you excited about all the breakthroughs that are happening in the science. And then we're going to sit down, I'm going to have a little conversation with him to draw out kind of what's going on with these various companies he's involved in, which kind of are opening up new spaces, applied spaces. And then we're, of course, going to have a good conversation with all of you, as is our way. So to start out, why don't we have David, let's give a warm welcome to David Edwards and have him explain. Let's go ahead. Yep, let's switch it. Thank you so much, Peter. It's really um, delightful to be here. And uh, I know it's a really diverse crowd, and it's kind of hard to look at all of you at the same moment. And I was promised that this is mostly going to be a conversation, so I look forward to the conversation starting. So I'd like to just give you an overview, uh, as uh, Pete was saying, about kind of the incredible um, discoveries that are being made in olfaction right now. Maybe just to say a few words about myself. I'm an applied mathematician from background, and, and my early work in uh, translation uh, related to um, inhaled insulin and a company I uh, started in the late 90s. And since then, I've been really interested in the delivery of health and wellness through the air. Right? So there's no medium that's more pervasive, obviously, than the air we breathe. And so the notion that every breath you take might impact your health and wellness. It does already, but that might be designed that way. It's really been fascinating uh, to me. So I'll come back to that. But let me just say a little bit about uh, olfaction. So there are um, two ways that we perceive scent. One we all are aware of, and it's in the perception of an odor in the room. And there's probably in this room right now about 20% of you that don't perceive really well. And it may be because you have a cold, it may be because of a genetic issue, it may be because of some other kind of an issue that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, but in general, some of us are good and some of us are not. And famously, dogs are really good. Um, interestingly, if you look at brain activity, uh, for those who are anosmic or are not sensitive to scent, you often see brain activity. So even though you may not be conscious of uh, the scent, uh, your perception of the scent is registered in your brain, which is super interesting. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, the olfactory nerve is the only sensory nerve that goes straight to the brain, but it goes to the so only that goes straight to the brain, but it's the only, uh, but it goes straight to the limbic portion of the brain or that portion of the brain where we process emotion. So we emotively process uh, scent uh, before we really cognitively uh, process scent. And so often we're not aware, of, generally, we're not aware of our perception of scent. But that's only one way that we perceive scent. And over the last few years, it's become clear in biology that actually the retronasal perception of scent, which uh, you are doing right now in drinking your uh, glass of wine, uh, which comes from your mouth, it turns out that our mouths uh, relative to dogs are completely made for the perception of uh, scent or aroma or flavor. So dogs can eat raw meat pretty well, but we don't eat, uh, well, depends. But generally, we're not very good at raw meat. 
Um, and so our noses, our oropharynx, is, is designed like a chimney to take uh, aroma that's in your mouth and immediately uh, present it to your olfactory receptor. So even if you may not be good at perceiving scent as odor, you're often pretty good at saying that's chocolate and that's uh, a lollipop. All right, so those two things we'll come back to. But just to make the point that, as you can imagine, uh, these signals that come to us from outside our bodies or inside our bodies uh, trigger a cascade of biochemical effects that have consequences. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So it's been learned over the last 10 years that olfaction is way more than just what's going on in your noses. So it turns out that the largest subclass of the human genome is the olfactory receptor subclass. It turns out that olfactory receptors are not only in your nose, but they're in your heart, they're in your lungs, they're in the circulating uh, cells of your immune system. So there's a whole conversation going on, an olfactory conversation going on between uh, the brain, uh, the immune system, and this incredible new organ that we've sort of knew for us, uh, discovered the microbiome. Uh, it turns out that when you eat wrong, uh, the microbiome uh, it expresses metabolites that are a signature of eating wrong, and they upregulate olfactory receptors in your gut. And those olfactory receptors then move throughout your body. And so it turns out that before you eat, you're more sensitive to scent than after you eat. For a long time, when you eat wrong, your sense of scent becomes perturbed, uh, partly uh, through what's going on in your gut. And this systemic olfaction area is a fascinating uh, area of biology. And it's beginning to overlay on a, a set of data that have been collected over the last 30 years. There's well over 100 clinical studies that have been done. And I'm going to give you some sense of what olfaction does to you, OK? And this we'll come back to a little bit later. But first set of data relates to your perception of scent. So it turns out that when kind of the first canary of Parkinson's is a loss of scent sensitivity. Uh, strong correlation between the onset of Alzheimer's and the loss of scent sensitivity. There's actually a strong correlation between scent sensitivity and longevity, which is being explored in uh, multiple ways, multiple species right now, and it's not simply a connection to disease. It turns out that before you have uh, diabetes, you're more sensitive to scent than after you have diabetes. Before you eat, than after you eat. Before you're stressed, than after you're stressed. Of course, before you have a cold, than after you have a cold. So it's not very helpful to tell you that you are not um, perceiving scent very well because it could be a common cold or the onset of Alzheimer's and we don't really know. Uh, so one of the, we're going to come back to that. Uh, one of the goals of medicine and biology right now is to define your phenotype well enough so I can say that if you're not sensitive to scent right now, it's okay. You've got you, you had too much to eat this morning, right? And so um, there are not many signals in the digital health area that can give us such rich information about our physiological and emotive states. So there's big interest um, in the likes of Google and others in what to do with that data and, of course, how to generate it. So that's one set of data. The other set of data, which is fascinating, relates to what, what this set do to you. Uh, so one of the interesting studies relates to rats. So take rats, expose rats to uh, the aroma of roasted coffee bean, and they run longer on uh, wheels than if they don't. And interestingly, they have higher endorphin levels. And of course, they have no experience with coffee before that. So there's this really interesting effect, no caffeine. Uh, it turns out that women, uh, several studies in women fasting than being exposed to chocolate, uh, the scent of chocolate and having higher incretin levels and other indicators of satiety. It doesn't mean that you can simply smell chocolate and kind of go without chocolate forever. Again, it really depends on your phenotype, and, but there's a big interest right now in understanding, well, how do we understand your phenotype, your state right now, so that we can know that that particular scent or that particular flavor will help your metabolism uh, come back into an equilibrium. So I'm going to talk in more detail about delivery of scent and what we're doing to kind of bring this frontier to you. But I want to make a comment, which gets back to what uh, Pete was saying. There's a, a big effort going on right now in digital medicine, well beyond scent, 
uh, related to the fact that our bodies uh, have evolved in natural conditions that are so unlike the conditions that we live in right now. And so we're kind of hacked by conditions that we did not really um, evolve out of. Uh, and those conditions are partly synthetic, they're partly just a rate of information flow and so forth. And it's led to neurologic and metabolic dysfunction. And so much of what's going on right now in digital health is looking, how do we kind of enter into this communication between your uh, senses and your bodies so that we can help your bodies know what to do with the sense signals that are coming that our bodies really didn't evolve for. And so one of those signals is sent. And so these kinds of um, data uh, are becoming and will be really helpful in figuring out how to create personal scent experiences, often very subtle, they may be in the process of eating, that help your neurologic and metabolic states reach a, um, a regulated uh, equilibrium so that you sleep better, you feel better, you're less depressed. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, space that we're working in right now. now Let's just talk about how good we've been at delivering scent, right? So natural scent comes to us um, in variable ways. So when you walk through a garden or you meet someone or you have a meal, scent uh, signals tend to be subtle and they vary. Uh, and that's pretty important actually to their metabolic and neurologic effect. It's very different than what we've been doing forever with fragrance or with scented rooms where we tend to create uh, scents that do not change uh, and that eventually lead us to uh, no longer noticing the scent. So after about 10 minutes exposure to a given scent that you've all experienced probably going into a new hotel room, it smells good for about 10 minutes and then you don't smell it, or you put fragrance on yourself and you s it smells great for about eight minutes, and then uh, you don't smell it throughout the day. Well, that's not how uh, nature deliver scent, and when it comes to the effects, the beneficial effects that I mentioned, we need to learn how to deliver scent in these variable ways, and also without allergens. So mostly scent is coming to us in nature without allergens, or some exceptions, but generally, particularly in the dialogue that goes on in your body uh, around olfactory receptors, scents are not allergenic, right? What's allergenic are the particles, uh, like with a candle, or the oils, or the, 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 the solvents uh, that with a fragrance, or with paint coming off a wall that um, create an allergenic problem. And so the issue, really the challenge right now is how do we deliver scent as nature does, and uh, deliver scent in such a way that it comes and goes. So in my conversation uh, here with Pete, we're going to talk about a few technologies that we've created. Um, this first platform is called O-Notes, uh, and I uh, founded it with my former student, Rachel Field, who may do a demo a little bit later. And the goal here uh, was to create a platform that would allow us to uh, deliver O-Notes or olfactory notes or kind of songs of scent like we deliver uh, music with iTunes. So how do you deliver a very personal scent experience in a way, right now, scent in the workplace and in public places is sort of a bad thing. It's kind of noisy, sort of what music was back when people carried you know, these boom boxes on their shoulders. So we're trying to create a very intimate, personal scent experience that varies in time, and we've created an app called O-Notes, and we'll talk more about what's happening with uh, that technology. We've also started a company with my colleague and co-founder, Adrian Clark, called Sensory Cloud where we're creating uh, flavor experiences that are um, independent of ingested material. So how do you deliver uh, flavor images to people in ways that people want, that are fun, uh, and that also um, help guide their metabolism and deliver nutrition? And so um, I'm, we'll talk sort of generally about Nimbus. This is a new product that we'll um, be launching this fall. Um, but um, we will do a, a demo with a uh, predecessor, which is called the WAF, which I, I, I created several years ago with Marc in, in Paris. And uh, we'll all have a chance to sip clouds of scotch. So that will happen here in a little bit. Um, and then I want to point out that in, we probably will have time here at the end to talk about the work we're doing with large companies and, uh, and universities, Harvard, MIT, UCSF. Uh, exploring, now that we know how to deliver scent and flavor in precise ways, 
uh, measuring uh, brain activity and other uh, phenotypical measures so that we can look at um, the human response to scent and flavor. It's leading us to an age where uh, food and, uh, and scents will also be therapeutic. Um, so one of my colleagues has just uh, launched the first video game, which is now FDA approved, and you can't play it without a prescription. It's for, uh, uh, it's for um, Alzheimer's, uh, a company called Achille. Uh, so that mixing of consumer space with health space is critical. Why is it critical? Because right now healthcare is really uh, treating a smaller and smaller group of people, right, who can afford to go to the right clinic and get the right care, which is costing more and more. So it's really important uh, for us to find ways to bring healthcare into the normal process of eating and drinking and having fun so that we can all have access to healthcare. So that's an area that we've created a company called Retro uh, that's exploring that. And that's the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to talk. <laughs> Thank wow. you. Thank you. Um, oops, that may be the end of the presentation, but it's by no means the end of the conversation. In fact, it's just the beginning. We thought that would be a good way to kind of open up everyone's, get everyone at least on some basic playing field here on uh, what uh, the foundation here was as we, as we explore some new dimensions of this. By the way, this thing that just fell off here is Creating Things That Matter. It's his book. Actually, it's coming out in the fall. This is the galleys before, and I guess the, the pre-publication book here. But uh, not only in his spare time of starting three companies and, and teaching up at Harvard, he's actually come up with a new book that has is related roughly to this I kind of new thing. Yeah. yeah, put it over there. So just to kind of draw it back in a little bit here, um, so what got you interested in this space? I mean, how did you actually get drawn into it initially? And I'm just curious of the kind of trajectory of you into this space, but also the more recent tra trajectory of all these breakthroughs. Is it like within the last few years and whatever? But how, yeah, how did you yeah. go and where did it, how, what's for, happening for, now? Thanks very much. So just to segue a little bit to the book, so it really relates oh. a lot to the book. I think one of the things that's happening today, in, uh, and, it, and it's, you'll find it in any really creative environment, there's a phase of creation which is super open-ended. And when this... Uh, area began honestly. I, I teach a class at Harvard called How to Create Things and Have Them Matter and uh, sort of provocative and I have interesting students take the class and so Rachel was one of the students with several other young women and we um, kind of brainstormed this idea of a, um, of a um, well placebo was the idea. We got to thinking about um, a virtual world of aroma. And so we were super far from anything practical, but just sort of thinking of something that nobody had ever done before. And so it led to a cultural exhibition in Paris, and we were kind of exploring, sending text messages of coffee. And it was just super open-ended. We were invited to give a talk at Wired magazine in London in 2013. And uh, we decided to do an experiment. And so we had a... Um, uh, a um, kind of an O-note bar set up outside of the um, talk, and we created a little app, and we said, you know, everybody create their own olfactory coffee, and then text that coffee to the bar, and go smell it at the bar. Of course, we were super excited. We said, well, who would do it? Because everybody did it once. Our app crashed, and then by the time we got it up, <laughs> we actually, there was a super, and the first person who came up, his hair was shaved, and he said, and he kind of experienced this thing, and he said, you know, I had, a, I had a, this accident, and I lost, um, actually, memory. And I'm getting it back, and I'm getting it back through taste and flavor. And so he was fascinated to kind of push, like, chestnut and smell chestnut. And so we were sitting there saying, oh, my God, this is so much bigger than texting. So that was really the beginning, right? And so then... It took a few years of us to kind of figure, you know, it's clearly where communications go. Clearly we will be 10 years from now in a world where sense signals will be as finely controlled, even more interestingly controlled than light signals and sound signals, and super subtle, not this kind of uh, Abercrombie and Fitch sort of uh, wave that hits you. And, um, but how do you get there, right? So people are used to scent in a certain way. So we began to experiment with uh, sent in books and sent in films and sent in you know various uh, kind of texting ways and uh, yes that's how but it eventually led us into this area of, of wellness and we'll talk more about that but that's kind of the the adventure um, and uh, the last thing to say is that I think as any of you who are um, kind of into creating 
Um, this space is so interesting that you start on the olfactory, like the orthonasal scent area, and then you say, oh my gosh, retronasal is super important. And so you begin, so we've kind of created these different companies, and uh, we're having a lot of fun and uh, not sleeping a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it accelerating now? What are the breakthroughs happening now? So, What's the contextual yeah, reason yeah. of why yeah. this is happening? A few reasons. So 2004, Nobel Prize uh, for understanding olfaction, um, more or less how, how olfaction works. There, I mentioned this, uh, the, the major challenges in medicine right now uh, and in moving medicine out of the clinic into uh, people's lives. One of the big problems is we know a lot about you when you're sick because you come into the hospital, we measure you. We don't know anything about you when you're well, right, because nobody's really measuring. And so now, well, phones can tell me if you walked a lot and maybe some other things about you. People are, you know, really interested in how can these devices both be of course, iPhone is like the most important medical device ever, but it was created for another reason. And so how do we create consumer or invite consumer experience that's delivering a value, but is helping give us information that helps us tell you how you're doing? So one big reason for the activity in the space is that medicine, and so there's a lot of resources that we're tapping into in that space. Another has to do with, you know, the consumer experience, consumer experience is moving towards the sensorial and for lots of reasons. As artificial intelligence is emerging, it turns out that we are mostly sensorial. That's kind of our, our, our game. And uh, <laughs> as, as we've learned um, through neuroscience, the um, uh, emotional uh, and intuitive data that we collect in the course of living makes us matter now. And we're learning to uh, pay much more attention to it um, in, uh, in academics and in, um, I think, also in our personal lives. And so the whole wellness movement and mindfulness and so forth. So there's a whole movement, uh, kind of a consumer movement. Last thing I'll say is that just from a purely commercial point of view, uh, there's a big group of industries that are scent-based that have not really um, entered into the digital revolution, actually. And that's one of the oldest industries out there, actually. And so there's quite an uh, interest. Uh, Me meaning, just, just to define that meaning, like perfumes or what? It's, it's the fragrance and flavors uh, industry in general. But, um, and you know there have been some laughable attempts to bring those kinds of things into entertainment and, and even into food in more kind of interesting ways. So the scent is hard. We'll talk a little bit more about why it is. There's three sensations that go through the air. Light, sound, scent. Light and sound are energy. I can turn on the lights, turn them off. We don't have light all over us. But when you fill the room with scotch, you can't really get rid of it. And so it's <laughs> the issue, how do you deliver signals of scent and not have them pollute? Uh, so that's been a challenge. Uh, but yeah, the, there's, there's major industries that have been waiting for this moment. Yeah. Fantastic, interesting context. Well, that brings up, though, Onos. I mean, honestly, how to deliver scent. Yeah. So do you want to, in fact, you have one of them yeah, here, right? Absolutely. Why don't you explain a little bit more for the, the beginner of what this is and how it works in a way that actually does yeah. control, yeah. I guess, the, the environment yeah, around it, absolutely. right? Absolutely, and so I may at some point call my co-founder. Can, uh, can, can we get someone to maybe move the, the, these wine glasses here? Or, or is that part of the deal? Uh, these are my, all my fault. Sorry. Oh, you need that? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, so all I have right, to move the whiskey, I have to wipe it, okay, good. All is right, this, so, so people can see it. Do you want to lift it up and just Yeah, well, I will. Okay, okay, okay. So. All right, go ahead. Do you want to hold my mic? That'd be yeah, great. Oh, that'd be that'd good. Be, okay, cool. All right, so, all right, so um, you can think of this as a, a, a scent, a digital scent player, um, kind of the equivalent of Beats. Um, so the idea is that this is going to create a scent signal for me, but not for you. And so it doesn't put much scent into the air. Um, scent is mass, so you have to have a kind of an espresso cartridge, right? So it's got this sort of scent cartridge uh, that has up to 12 scents, up to four in that little disc in that cylinder, up to four here, up to four here. And so what happens when I turn this on, so there's a little button here, you kind of push that, and then this light goes on, and you sort of might see these things sort of spin around, they kind of get their orientation. And uh, I can put this back on, but I'm not going to, just so you can see how this works. So what do people do? So initially we developed this for the car. You know, we thought, in fact, we were approached by one of the major car, uh, car companies. So yeah, put in the car. It fills the car really nicely. And we launched it in a uh, pilot launch at the Rubin Museum. It's a great scent place here in New York. And, uh, and we started to watch how people used it. And most people were not using it in the car. They were mostly using it in the day. They were mostly using it in the afternoon at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
So in fact, what they were doing, they were not using this to, they were using this to uh, enhance their performance, actually. And so they were using it to pick themselves up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon instead of having a coffee, or to calm themselves down when their boss walks in and they kind of have to deal well, with well, that. Well, yeah. before you get into that, just uh, actually, can you explain that? Because we haven't really hit that. that, that there so are there's, there's a few things that scent do, that scent does, uh, uh, that kind of can be categorized. One is to um, pick you up to pick up your metabolism. Scents like you know, pepper or uh, peppermint uh, or um, cinnamon uh, actually um, pick you up. This is not like caffeine in your blood, but it does uh, pick you up. There are scents like lavender and uh, uh, sea um, uh, scape, what we call it, the smell of the sea air that uh, tend to calm people down. So what's interesting, there are three major fragrance houses in the world, Givaudan, Farmanish, and IFF. IFF is local. And if you go into the labs of these uh, companies, you'll see reams of data. Uh, so in any new scent that's developed, um, they will test, or generally test on uh, consumers. And, uh, and they will ask consumers a few things. Uh, the emotive effect, the color, and the texture, and there's incredible correlation around those um, uh, around those parameters. So there's this really interesting um, uh, pick you up, calm you down, and uh, carry you to a place of memory, right? So so scent is delivered to your hippocampus, the seat of long-term memory. And so when I play the scent of suntan lotion, um, it takes you someplace. Uh, and so those are three things that uh, people do and are interested to do in a workplace. Um, so that's how people have been using it and kind of gets to how um, we're really bringing it out commercially. I'm going to show you here the app. There's an app called Onotes. Uh, it's free on iOS and on uh, Android. So it kind of connects by Bluetooth, so it's connected. And then it's going to show me a uh, playlist, a series of plays. You can make your own. And so if I tap one of these, it will it'll play uh, a sequence of scents that vary in time. They're pretty subtle. And uh, if I'm in a car, it takes about a minute to fill the car. If I'm at a desk, sometimes I smell it, and sometimes I don't, or at least I'm conscious of it. Now, what's interesting, so I just played it, so now it's, it's playing guava. True. Yeah, it is true. guava. Yeah, we, we practiced that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, and then it'll go on to play other scents. We can also play um, individual scents. And so I can play suntan lotion. Ah, yeah, yeah, suntan lotion. Anyway, we'll not keep doing this. We, you, uh, you'll all get this experience if you want it. And uh, you can do other things. Basically, what people are doing, uh, by the way, if you look at um, these dots, every scent or O note has a dot. And the dot will tell you, it picks you up, it calms you down, it helps you get away. And so you can kind of do what you, you choose the scent you want, and then you have it help you as you want it to help you. Uh, you can do other things. If you look around on the app, you can kind of mix your own scents. You can also play. Any uh, song of your favorite streaming, uh, uh, like Spotify, um, and uh, it will choose the two or three scents that are most emotively connected to that song, so you can actually smell your music, which is interesting. And you might think, well, why would you do that? It turns out that, as you may know, uh, your emotive reaction to um, more than one sensory stimuli is greater than just one sensory stimuli. So there's a uh, super interesting. Uh, so that's how um, Onotes works. So you choose your, um, your scent cartridge. And right now, um, this we've been um, experimenting with consumers for the last uh, year and, uh, and, and, and now have uh, gotten into some major um, partnerships with uh, multinational corporations bringing scent into the workplace. Fascinating. So future of the workplace, talk about that. So you're talking to multinationals. Why would they be interested in this? So as most of you probably know, um, unlike here at Capgemini, there's a major worker wellness uh, problem going on around the world and, uh, and um, it has been growing. And uh, what can be done? Uh, so obviously various things can be done, um, but the notion of designing the work space itself, obviously there are various things, light and sound and touch and food, um, the notion of uh, designing a personal scent experience is really interesting. Up until now, scent has not been really useful in the workplace, both because of the vectors that brought it to us with sometimes allergens, and also your scent may not be my scent. And so how do you make it personal? Um, so as we um, developed this uh, platform with consumers, 
um, a major multinational uh, company invited us to do a test uh, last summer um, in, uh, here in the United States uh, went super well. And so we now are into other tests and in other uh, major corporate relationships. And so the interest uh, with multinationals is to give to their employees a um, tool that they can use or not and that will typically be used at work. People will take it with them in the car and go home. Uh, there's also the possibility of creating, and we're in conversations about creating uh, scent experiences with the employees. Let me turn it around. The other piece of this, uh, Pete, that is fascinating, I think, both to consumers and to corporations, has to do with the data that this generates. Um, right now, we get data from our Fitbit, which kind of tells us something we probably, well, anyway, it's helpful, but maybe not as helpful as it might be. Uh, scent data. Uh, what we smell, when we smell it, and, and, and the effect it has on us has a much more um, significant uh, biological meaning. And so what we're uh, doing with corporations is aggregating data and giving uh, corporations a sense of how their employees are um, um, living through tax season or are going through difficult moments, and then looking to uh, create uh, sensible data that we can give back to consumers to help consumers understand uh, their own levels of stress and, and how to deal with it. Um, so, so, so just to kind of put that in concrete, so if, if, if you're stressed, you're, you're tired, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you could hit that little thing and get the pick-me-up scent that's going to help you, but that somehow also can be a signal to the company saying, oh my god, everyone's why is it at 3 o'clock in the yeah. afternoon <laughs> so on Friday it. afternoon? What yeah, happened yeah, yeah. exactly that exactly. made that happen? Right. So to be honest, uh, right now there's some um, value that uh, we're developing with corporations. It's super exciting. One of the things that's also interesting in this corporate um, dialogue is that corporations are increasingly, and heads of um, HR are increasingly aware of how important science and uh, frontiers of science are to their understanding of wellness. As I mentioned earlier, we don't really understand what wellness is, right? And so there's a, an interesting um, uh, partnership that we're developing with uh, one of our major um, corporate partners, uh, well-known in the information uh, space, uh, and our corporate partners. How can the uh, learnings that we're um, gathering at Frontiers as we understand how scents impact uh, biology, translate back into the workplace, and how can the use of the system in the workplace inform the Frontiers? So there's, I think, uh, you know, a lot of talk, as you probably know, Pete, about the future of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. we're, really where we're going is into a world where we're all uh, part of an experiment and uh, olfaction because there's nothing ingested, there's nothing injected in our body, there's an opportunity, such a low risk profile, there's a really interesting opportunity to invite um, uh, corporations and their employees into uh, some real cutting edge um, uh, pioneering of this, this whole notion of uh, wellness. Okay, well there's gonna be time for conversation so people can, we can build on that. But let's go to your next company. Uh, and actually, by the way, speaking of that, if we want to advance the slides too, um, you want to just yeah, take just a, well, just to, kick um, us to, so we we kind of did that. Yeah, we so did. So just to, oh no, it's in the car. And this, by the way, just so you see, this is a typical day uh, when we look at how people use oh notes. Uh, so you can sort of see that uh, they start um, and then kind of mid. It's pretty uh, regular use. The number of uses in a day. This is from one of the companies. And then there's kind of maximum going on at three o'clock, which is super interesting. And then there's some evening stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about flavor images, and so this is now um, the, the story. Um, we were talking about uh, creating these uh, flavor experiences, and uh, we invented uh, what's, what's called the WAF several years ago. And um, the WAF is a carafe, and you put in your favorite liquid, and I put in scotch, uh, which is not necessarily my favorite liquid, but it's really interesting in this form factor. And when I turn it um, over, a sound wave goes through the scotch and causes cavitation, which makes droplets go in the air. And now I have a really interesting, um, can you hold that a second? Sure. Uh, a really interesting uh, sort of cloud of scotch, yeah. which um, I can, well, firstly, just see how it sort of behaves like a liquid. Um, and so that's about a milligram or less than a milligram of scotch. So this, we're not vaporizing scotch. 
It's just a milligram of scotch. It's not much scotch. But it's all kind of waiting to kind of get into my um, olfactory system, right? So I can smell it from here, and I'm, I'm, I want a scotch. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> all right. So, so what's interesting, and you should all have this experience, and one of the uh, things when uh, you're ready for kind of the demo uh, phase here is for you to experience a, an O-notes versus a, um, uh, a sensory cloud. And so you take a straw, and then you sip out the... Um, you know, less than a milligram of scotch. And so you'll see it's a very heady experience. You essentially ingest nothing. Um, it, uh, it gives an amazing um, perception of the, uh, uh, the scotch. It's used now by uh, leading baristas. Uh, when Ardbeg uh, had its 200th year anniversary a few years ago, we made a thousand of these and they distributed around the world. And we have various videos. One that I love is in Taipei, 165,000 people experienced scotch in Taipei because they could experience it in the cloud form. <laughs> um, so we have been for a few years just experiencing with some top chefs around the world. Uh, Massimo Bottura uh, makes, um, as you may know, he, he has an incredible dish of four. Uh, different ages of Parmesan, and so now he makes a cloud of Parmesan. Um, and uh, Ben Shuri at Attica makes a cloud of sushi. Um, and, uh, and so there's various really interesting things going on. But what we're interested in now is bringing this to consumers in a mass market way. And so we've, um, our, uh, will, whoops. Can you take, can you take this? Excuse me? Uh, this, is this is actually not the final slides, but it doesn't really matter. So there's a, there's a new product that will come out here. Oh, you know what? It's earlier. So, sorry, let me go back and just show here. Um, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So, this, so we are uh, bringing out this fall a, um, a tabletop uh, handheld um, do you need to hold this? Product, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, that uh, will allow people to uh, deliver uh, flavor images on top of water. Uh, or coffee, or any drink, um, and uh, and create flavored, and um, and will actually be delivering other kinds of nutrients uh, experiences with no additives, uh, and uh, are beginning to um, yeah. So we'll be bringing that out this fall. So that's sensory cloud. Well, just one question on that before. Um, so when you smell that scotch, are you or let's say it's coffee or whatever, are you actually getting the Alcohol or or, yeah. or the or the caffeine through that or how, how does the smell so, work in that way? So the um, amount of alcohol is very minuscule as well as uh, caffeine. If you're having a coffee, what's interesting, if you uh, top a glass of water with a cloud of strawberry, and then you drink the water, your brain, since 80% of your flavor experience is is olfactory, your brain is telling that you're drinking flavored. Uh, water. So it's really an interesting way of not only um, bringing you f incredible flavor experiences with no uh, ingested material, but also um, uh, it's, it becomes an interesting nutrient delivery uh, uh, platform. Which goes to your next company. Which gets to my last. Wait, but just yeah. one last question on that. So for example, could you have a, an odor scent that's like Coke, Cola, yeah. Yeah. and drink and drink a, a, a water that smells like that and have no sugar, no nothing, and, and, but the same experience of having a Coke? Yeah, I think in principle, like, of course it depends, it depends on the quantity of liquid and the, and the intensity of the cloud, but in principle, um, that's absolutely uh, right. And I think that um, at the end of the day, this is not delivering calories, and so you cannot live on clouds alone, but um, <laughs> it, it's, it's really um, super interesting. And, and coming back to what I said earlier from a healthcare point of view, if we can, as we get smarter and smarter about flavor images and their effect on metabolism, the ability to use flavor images to curb appetite, to uh, reverse food addictions is fascinating. So uh, in, the, in the medium and long term, uh, this is really uh, just a fascinating area. And, and so finally, uh, yeah. Let's, yeah. So go to the third company. Is that where we're going? Yeah, that's exactly. Where going? So you were jumping to that. OK. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, there's a third company that then now moves into really using those same pathways to now start getting medicine and kind of yeah. re really going the next mile instead yeah. of injecting things or eating things or yeah. taking pills. Yeah. So talk about so that. So if I know that when you have a um, vertigo experience in a VR um, simulation, that the perception of cinnamon 
alters your brain activity in some interesting way. The notion that um, some variant of cinnamon, for example, might become therapeutic and something that you should actually take when you're in a vertigo kind of circumstance. That's just a particular example. So what's happening is as we're starting to look at how scent, so we know that scent has a significant impact on uh, physiology. As we start to look through careful clinical trials at how that overlays um, emotive experiences uh, and other health kind of conditions, the idea that scents will become uh, or flavors will become therapeutic, that we'll know how to deliver them at the right moment and in the right dose uh, to the right target to actually um, help you lose weight or help you sleep better um, or help you not experience vertigo. That's absolutely where we're going. And so um, Retro is a company that's looking at special formulations uh, that allow us to, um, you know, this will be a regulatory pathway, uh, but um, quite interesting. You know, one of the reasons why it costs so much to um, develop drugs today is that the likelihood of drugs um, hurting us is, is often about as strong as it is helping us. And so as you lower the risk profile, as, as you do with scent, the opportunity that you could really uh, streamline um, uh, therapeutic development is really interesting. So, so step back about that. So the third company is doing what? Developing... It, or, or tell us about, it, a little bit more it's about a, what it's the It's a delivery doing. platform. It's a delivery platform that will be, do you, do you and, and I don't want to get there, into or? too much detail, but it's a really yeah. new company, basically. But it's allowing us to deliver um, olfactants, um, mostly through the retronasal pathway, uh, uh, really effectively to the nasal uh, epithelium. And, and have we're really focusing in, mostly initially on metabolic conditions. Um, and it's really new. So it's not like taking a drug that you would normally like insulin inject and do it That's through right. through the nose. It's not that. Not at all. Not at but, all. Okay. Not at all. And it gets back to what I mentioned earlier about the video games that now are there's a video game coming out for Alzheimer's and and of course um, it's a video game. But uh, now that we're seeing that these sense signals have really significant physiological effects, as we learn how to titrate those and kind of um, uh, correlate those with physiological states. Uh, they become therapeutic, and we can really uh, help uh, guide um, uh, the human condition to better health uh, in, in, in ways that are, will be regulated. But we're not injecting, we're not delivering vaccines, we're really delivering scent molecules. That you nevertheless have some Yes, health, and, and you can imagine we'll have to, this cannot be, we're not going to prevent everybody from eating chocolate because we've now proven that chocolate helps you. I mean, chocolate is chocolate and you can breathe it and do whatever you want. But there will be special ways, there may be special ways to deliver chocolate um, that are not already in, um, in foods that um, would be especially helpful. Wow, that's interesting. And now, just to give a little, one, you can't say a lot about that company, but what's, you can talk about the name, and, and could you give some sense of who you're working with out there in terms of it's, developing? It's really this? early, and so we have a, some conversation with VCs, but we're really uh, gathering data, and we're, we're building a partnership with, um, uh, I mentioned, a, a, a large um, corporation out on the uh, West Coast, and um, and uh, that's in the big data. And, 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 yeah, and, and, and so th one of the things that's going on right now in the major medical centers around the country and really around the world, uh, is this quantification of phenotypes. Since I know you, when you come into my hospital and you, you have a diabetic condition, um, your condition is sort of known in the context of diabetes. When you're out of the hospital, uh, how do I frame your condition? And so there's a clinical trials that are going on in normals, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in diabetics and cancer and other um, uh, kinds of populations, and and gathering everything we can know from head to toe about your condition, uh, so that we can quantify your phenotype. So scent, scent sensitivity, it all becomes part of that. Um, and as we know that better, we can know that well, lavender works for Rachel, it doesn't work for me, uh, and we can know why. And so we can kind of know that, well, if you've got that particular phenotype right now, lavender is going to do it. That'll help you sleep. And how does that interact? So phenotype, and just for those that don't fully understand it, phenotype r relate to your genetic kind of makeup. It's partly. Partly it's a genetic makeup, but it's also did you sleep last night? It's also did you have a car accident yesterday? And so it's everything um, genetic and environmental that's um, uh, defining your physiological state right now. 
So as we learn that, just to kind of, and we also, everyone's pretty much going to have their genome cranked out at yeah. 100 bucks a pop or something. Knowing those two sets of data, will that, what, where's, the, where's the future so of the it will allow, here? So, That's going to so really, what really I'm trying to get to here. is that obviously the light in this room, the sound, what we touch, eat, um, smell, all of it sort of intuitively we understand is influencing our physiological state. And understanding how that influences and, uh, and, and being prognostic really uh, requires us, us to understand you right now, and that's this whole quantitative uh, phenotyping. Um, yeah. Okay, so as final question here before we roll out to everybody else here. Um, so when we think about the future of healthcare, so the third category that you start, just starting baby steps, I guess, in your third company mm -hmm. here. But in that space, what do you expect in the next, I don't know, 10 years, no, with, as we learn that phenotype, as we understand the genetic kind so, of background, if we can yeah. put those together, are we look, so looking I, for a real transformation yeah, in healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. So I think right now we're in this kind of baby uh, phase in uh, digital health where all of us who have uh, uh, devices that are giving us information are getting too much information. I don't know what to do with this information. And so um, we're moving uh, in the next, you know, it's, it's happening now, but in the next five years to um, situations. And we, um, so Brad Jakeman, the CEO of Onos here, um, uh, are exploring, well, how can we make scent devices like these um, unconscious uh, and, and kind of playing uh, scents when we need them? And without us having to kind of figure it out. And so what's going to be happening, I think, in the digital health space is that our cognition will kind of be removed as the barrier to um, value delivery. And, uh, and uh, the, the kinds of sen sense signals that will come to us include touch, for sure, include um, sound and light, for sure, include scent, for sure, and, uh, and will include flavor. I think that we'll have... Um, you know, my guess is that um, much of the um, progress and advance in, um, in food and beverage as far as metabolic health is concerned may be uh, not on the plate, actually. It may be in the whole environment that is bringing you to the plate or whatever it is that you're um, consuming from. So the sensory uh, environment, any really great restaurant understands that the sensory environment will be just increasingly well designed. So I'm hopeful that the whole f sort of field of healthcare sort of moves into the background uh, because the, well, there's eight billion of us. <laughs> and the hope of bringing these kind of advances to the whole world really is based on people going about their daily life, surviving, and kind of doing, making ends meet and uh, hopefully getting health care in the, in the process. Fantastic. Let's open it up. Um, a lot of you, some of you have backgrounds actually in this space, but, um, but let's say any questions that want to kind of emerge quickly here. We got a guy in the front row here. Now here's the thing, we're doing this live stream and we're later edit it. We got a podcast going. So when we give you the, um, the mic, just stand up and actually just introduce yourself and then ask a question or make a comment. Does someone want to get, we got, we got a guy here, sorry. Hi, Baratui. Uh, a question relative to the flavor cloud technology. What's required to create the flavor experience? So, for example, with the strawberry water, do you need actual strawberries? Can you use synthetics? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, a flavored water, it depends on the quality of uh, strawberry experience you want, but the um, technology is quite simple, so it's a liquid. Honestly, um, if it has significant colloids like milk, it's a problem in terms of making, so it's a little technical thing, but generally any liquid from wine to whiskey to, to tomato soup, um, it's the liquid. And so what happens, the way this works is that this sound wave passes through the, um, ultrasound wave passes through the liquid. When the pressure's low, the gas that's like from the air that's dissolved in the liquid expands, forms bubbles. And they then go run to the top and then they burst and they create droplets. So you're not changing anything, uh, you're only putting the liquid in the air. So if it tasted like strawberry, once it's in the air, it tastes like strawberry and the experience is like strawberry. It's true that there's such an ephemeral sort of experience that this especially works well with really strong 
flavors. And so that's why scotch is great. Um, and uh, and uh, but, but, but yeah. just if I could add on that, you might have also met, how did, how does it work in the O notes where there's no actual so thing? in in O notes and I can show you and you you should all come up and experience this if you want to but um, in in the uh, in 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 O notes um, the cartridge has uh, gel. We work with um, IFF International Flavors and Fragrances and. Uh, uh, and so they have a special gel that we have in um, in these. Uh, if you open those cartridges up, they're channels that air blows through, and um, and in these gels we've got we we have uh, um, oils uh, that are about eighty percent or ninety percent. It's mostly oil, and so what happens is that air blows through and it just evaporates uh, the um, molecules. And so there's, you know, you can imagine that lasts for a month of everyday use and it's a super small amount and it's like eight different cents. So you, you're, once you, uh, th this creates a, a scent experience in about a, a, a meter cubed. And so because of the, uh, um, the, the, to the power of three nature of, of volume, once you go to a small volume, it doesn't take much um, material actually. So um, that's how we do it. Fantastic. Um, other questions out here? Okay, we got someone back here and I see somebody over here. But let's go over back here first. Hey, how's it going? No, we got it here. Julia Tanner first. with AIG. Just a quick question on O Note. Um, so it's a, it's a very very interesting concept, by the way. Thank, thanks for the presentation. But um, how, you know, say I'm very stressed out at 3 p.m. and cinnamon is the is the flavor that that calms me down, and I start smelling cinnamon every day at 3 p.m. Will I then start associating cinnamon with being stressed out? And how does the delivery of uh, the delivery mechanism that, that you're now changing completely, how does that change the perception of the scent itself? Uh, so those are two questions, Same I question. think. And, and so the first question, um, uh, I invite you to experience it. My, my guess is that the memory will be that cinnamon is helping you climb down from a, if, if it happens to be cinnamon, from a stress wall as opposed to, but um, the, um, you know, I think that the um, ability for um, scent experience to kind of um, change your memory of, of scent. So if I smell, so one of these scents you'll smell is suntan lotion. And so if I smell it all winter, do I forget about the experience of scent in the summer? And so I, that you should experience, I don't think so, um, but I think that the, um, um, this is a whole new uh, kind of field, right? Uh, but I think we all have um, the um, experience of, um, for example, being around people who put suntan lotion on and we constantly go across and we constantly think of the beach. And so I, I think that that's it, the idea of reversing our um, uh, memory is probably unlikely. Um, in terms of does the delivery of scent change the scent itself. I think it depends on what the source material is of the scent. And so if I'm delivering the actual scent uh, of um, lime, then it is the scent of lime. Now, as you probably know, um, scents are not like colors. It's not like we can sort of say that's the molecule that is the scent of, uh, and so there's like a zillion different limes, right? And so um, that's uh, an old art. <laughs> And did you, one little follow-up on that. So, so when you smell that suntan, it's not, are you thinking about, is it popping up a memory of, oh, me on the beach with my girlfriend when I was 17 or something? It's or, triggering a memory, yeah. So it is, not just, oh, beach, beach is good, I like well, beaches. Well, I, I can't really speak for you, actually, <laughs> so I don't really know. I don't really know what goes on. But, um, uh, <laughs> but when you say it's tied takes you away. It's taking you away to some place that you remember somehow, or it's echoing a memory somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it depends, and I'm, this is really moving beyond my expertise, but I think it depends upon the degree of emotive connection to that particular experience. And so it may take you to a very um, special place, but I think it depends on just the degree of emotional connection uh, to that uh, particular memory and scent. Um, Fascinating. Okay, we got another question here. Do you want to stand up? Stand up and Oh, you have That's a right. laptop? Uh, okay, you can sit there. I, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, I'm interested in understanding more if well, you... Well, could you just identify yourself and... Oh, sorry, and Diane Tucker is my name. Um, if you could unpack the kind of causal relationship, if, or I understand there's a 
correlation, but if there's any sort of hunch about the causa causal relationship between uh, loss of smell uh, and, and Alzheimer's. So for example, yeah. I know that um, with hearing, there's also that kind of relationship, and it's understood that because essentially that as less data gets to the brain and the less engaged the brain is, the less there is, you know, the, the brain in fact deteriorates from the absence of data. So that's my first question. My second is sort of along with this, um, this sort of rise in the sensory is also, I mean, we know increasingly, you know, 98% of the stuff by which people make decisions is unconscious, but that's also been associated with, you know, a decline in rationality in some ways, and, and some, de some declines more broadly in concern about the loss of engagement with rationality. And I guess I wonder, is any of your work concentrating on ways in which one can engage in the sensory and the analytic and the rational and all that kind of stuff at the same time yeah. without one being yeah. coming at the cost of the other? Right, so this sounds like a longer conversation after words, but uh, just to uh, try and unpack both of those uh, questions. So firstly, as far as the causality, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's um, or diabetes, uh, that's an active area of research. Um, given the early onset, uh, one um, hypothesis is that there's degradation of um, the uh, pathway, of the olfactory nerve pathway. Um, and then uh, there are just uh, obvious um, brain anatomical changes that happen in um, uh, neurodegenerative disease, which given the fact that we're, uh, this, the olfactory nerve delivers scent information to the hippocampus, which is the seat of long-term memory, is that um, part of the brain is changing. Uh, it's obviously impacting. And so it's an area of research trying to understand, um, and, and, and that's generally where that is. Um, as far as uh, cognition and, and emotion, as you say, that's a hot and interesting area of, so we definitely understand now that, that judgment and uh, you know, rational judgment is, is really aided by emotional, um, and, and you kind of want to toggle between um, emotive and, 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 and cognitive um, uh, processing, and sometimes more one and more the other. Areas where some interesting work is going on as far as scent and cognition is concerned. You're probably aware of the fact that if I um, am memorizing information um, um, and smelling a particular scent, my ability to recall that um, information is heightened by the um, experience of that same scent. Um, we know that when people um, sit in a theater and, and watch a kind of a traumatic or kind of an action show and have a scent in the theater as opposed to not having a scent in the theater two weeks later when you uh, ask for recall, um, sort of cognitive recall of, is a lot higher for those who had the scent and have it again. Um, so there's clearly a uh, scent can be um, just from a memory point of view. We know that um, uh, scent um, uh, has an impact on, uh, it can have an impact on levels of stress. We know that um, levels of stress can correlate to judgment um, and to cognitive processing. Um, you know, and I, I really want to point out, as everybody here probably knows, that scent, uh, this is not, um, th these are generally pretty subtle effects of scent. And, and while some scents can have very, very powerful uh, effects, Generally, um, I, I don't want to overstate um, uh, the ability to control diabetes, for example, by smelling certain scents. So you, they have a, a certain um, kind of secondary effect. But there are those kinds of uh, studies. OK, uh, would, folks on this side, we had just, I know we got some folks here, but let's just shift to this. Oh, here, let's go right here, this guy. Uh, but here's the thing. You're all going to be able, while we have drinks afterwards, to experience both these kind of um, toys up here, or not toys, sorry, these tools up here. Hi. Go ahead. Ian Barber. Um, I was curious. Could, could, when you get, say, just okay. when, you give, when you give your name, just give a little bit of your, oh, where sure. you're coming from. Ian like, Barber. Well, I have a company well, called Aromatherapy Guild. Oh, there we go. Manufacture aromatherapy okay. products. Um, I'm curious that since memory is such a personal thing, how do you go about, does a person go about yeah. deciding what yeah. sense they are going to include in their in their own notes, or yeah. what's going to work, what's not going to work yeah. for Absolute, any particular absolutely. individual? So yeah, so 
you know, it's kind of, this is a ter really bad analogy, but it's a little bit like clothes, right? So clothes are also personal, but there are certain basic um, things that we all sort of tend to do. Um, so we know, as I mentioned the study in rats, right? Rats have no connection to coffee, and yet they do run longer when they're exposed to uh, the aroma of roasted coffee bean. And so there are certain effects that scent have, um, scents have um, that are um, generally true for the human population. Um, as you point out, uh, cultures uh, and, and personal experience leads to very individual kind of um, association with scent. And I, I don't want us to forget the whole flavor. Um, and I think that when you come up here and experience O notes versus the um, sensory cloud, you'll see that you know, flavor is just an enormous um, part of our lives, and, and olfaction is a big piece of that. And, and there again, you know, chocolate kind of does what chocolate does for most people. And, and so there's kind of some generalities here. We're sort of in that goal, you know, frankly, when we started, we were super interested in the ability to bring people really unusual scents. Uh, and so that, and because we, we it became clear that in the, population we were dealing with was not really the fragrance world. People were interested, not interested in Chanel 5, but they were interested in other things. And so we made things like dirt and other things that we thought would be really interesting. We quickly became um, aware of the fact that um, scent is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like you're ingesting something. And so having a bad scent experience is something you kind of never forget. So we quickly moved to those scents that are kind of universally appreciated, right? Now, as this moves forward, the personalization of the experience is fascinating, right? And so your, what you do and the kind of culture that you bring to this sort of um, um, field of communication is, is, is huge, right? So we're, I'm personally really interested in the ability to um, express ourselves through scent um, and, and, uh, and communicate through scent. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, say things that we never really could, or really, frankly, even don't know how to say. And also the ability to cross species in that kind of communication. So I think this personal, I, I think your personal connection to scent holds you know, volumes about what it means to be you now, today. And so I think that that's, but we're kind of at the beginning right now learning how people um, really connect with scent design. What's interesting, just as I'm unpacking it, and, and again, that we're in this applied innovation exchange where I was trying, how do you apply these things? But it's interesting how you've iterated constantly. You mm -hmm. tried something, you mm -hmm. tried, didn't work, you keep, yeah. you, you kind of have a very startup y approach to kind of applying these. I think, in a, I, personally, I think since the internet, uh, the innovation is happening, and we see it in the iPhone, we see it really in any uh, high tech um, uh, technology, there's this feedback. So, really, the public is increasingly co-creating the future with um, inventors and pioneers, and it's super humbling for an inventor, um, uh, and it's also fun to be in this dialogue. So we do, just to point out the word fun, some of this will hopefully seem fun to you. Uh, inviting people to do something that they've never been, done before needs to be beautiful, right? And so this gets to my book, really, about the importance of aesthetics. As we pioneer this world, uh, this future that can be so frightening to so many, uh, making it beautiful um, and including in that is, is a, a kind of a joie de vivre that comes along with um, experimentation. So we do a lot of experimentation and we learn a lot. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, let's focus over this side. Do we have that? Okay. We got a woman here. Okay. Oh, you got one there? Is it camera? Oh. oh. Okay, okay, there's someone back there. Could you stand up and... Yeah, um, so my name's Emelina. I work with hashtag arts meets biz. <laughs> and actually, this is a great follow-up to what you were just saying. Have you thought about the ethical implications of the data collection you're doing on the employees yeah. with your um, partnerships with corporations? Yeah. And dare I bring up uh, what happened recently with Facebook and how that's kind of blown open yeah. this whole... Yeah, it's huge. Thing. It's huge, as you're saying. So um, everyone owns their data. And so we, um, we are... Um, uh, Open and and uh, and 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 uh, and um, and um, also um, strong proponents um, of the value of aggregate data um, and learning that comes from aggregate data. So, um, but the personal um, ownership of data, I think, particularly when it comes to scent, is is uh, really critical. Um, and 
that's how we you know, manage it. So everybody knows that the, their sent data is not going to be shared with anybody else. What's that? Uh, no, the employer does not get, if you're, uh, uh, you, then nobody knows how you behaved with sent. So they will know how, now if you happen to be in a company of one, then you have to deal with that with your employee. But in general, um, we aggregate the data. So um, they kind of know how everybody did. Um, and uh, that's how we're, and we're working with big companies, yeah. And people could, they opt in, I'm assuming? I mean, yeah, they totally, they, absolutely. It's a and, total yeah. opt in, yeah. opt in, I think. Okay, um, oh, we, we got more people go out here. Okay, so how about right here and then we'll come over here. Can you stand up and, yeah. Yep. Hi, my name is Lisa George. I'm with Keystone Health. I was curious, uh, with diabetes and Parkinson's, scent is not the major uh, sensory loss. You diabetes, you lose touch, you lose. How did you, um, Parkinson's memory and stuff like that, how did you justify to those who um, were paying for the, funding your research, how did you justify to them how, uh, to go with scent? Uh, well, interesting. So um, uh, full disclosure, so this work um, has been done by others. And, and there's a major institute at UPenn that goes back, uh, I think, 30 years. Uh, that has really been uh, pioneering um, this work in scent sensitivity and disease. Uh, well, it just turns out that scent, um, A, there's an issue of accessibility. And so it's an, it's, it's an easily accessed um, indicator. It turns out that scent, the loss of scent sensitivity is, happens two years bef before uh, quaking motion in, in um, Parkinson's. And so there's, it, in, in a true scientific um, sort of spirit, uh, there has been um, interest, whether it's the NIH or um, various uh, you know, companies and, and, and governmental and nonprofit associations to understand, right? So it's really about understanding. Um, and uh, you know, some of the work, as I mentioned, there, so just to give you a, a concrete example, there was a study done at the University of Chicago uh, several years ago. It started in 2005, I think it ended in 2011, and it took um, elderly, 1,000 um, people, and it, uh, they were in different groups of normals and cancer sufferers and, and kidney sufferers. There was a, a bunch of different groups, and they had everyone um, smell five cents. And then they, you know, some couldn't smell any, some one, two. And then at the end of the um, study, they looked at uh, mortality. And the uh, second biggest connector, uh, you know, correlate to mortality was um, uh, lack of scent sensitivity. And it was not a direct correlate with neurodegenerative or other kind of disease. And so this goes along with some really, really, really interesting animal work that's going, that, that's showing that the olfactory bulb is a key um, part of our metabolic uh, system, and uh, this is a, we can talk about it later. So there's a, just a lot of pioneering interest, and um, and I, I but I don't think we have all the answers for sure. Did you? Did you I mean, we're, we're going to shift actually um, to this side here too. I know, I know, we're moving it around, but there's a guy back here from the perfume industry. Do you want to get the mic back to there? Good evening, I'm Michael from Givadon. I've been hiding from Matt for us all night because I know we're in competition with uh, IFF and I know you're working with IFF, so. But I, I won't go into a, an industrial we, question. We started working with Givaudan, so we love Givaudan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, I have a mother, um, she's suffering from Alzheimer's and I'm fortunate enough to be working with Givaudan so I'm able to um, give her blotters to, let's say, uh, 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 one of my questions is that pathway that is, let's say, um, disrupted uh, from an olfactory standpoint within the limbic system, is that and somehow um, reversible? Uh, are you capable of uh, regenerating that neural pathway such that if a person does lose, yeah. uh, lose that, that is a reconnection, yeah. if you give them a, um, a host of a, a, an overwhelm, that o yeah. olfactory pathway, I tried that. Yeah. I experimented in that because also I'm a biochemist, you know, yeah. from a, uh, from a scholastic uh, standpoint. I would give her blotters of what she was more familiar with. Yeah. She's Jamaican, so if I would give her a blot of pimento berry and 10 other ingredients to smell, 
she was able to say that, yes, I do remember you giving me this already, the pimento yeah. berry. If I were to give her a sample of, say, myrrh, and where you know, m most people have not you know, at, at the uh, occasion to smell myrrh, she would smell it once, and then I would give her again four blotters later, three yeah. blotters later, and she would act as if it was a blotter she was not familiar with. So yes, al Alzheimer's affects the yeah. longer-term memory yeah. Yeah. and the short-term memory, but if I were to give her a blot of galbanum, and the, she's Jamaican, she's not Iranian, or, yeah. Af or from Afghanistan, she's not familiar whatsoever with galbanum, but she would quickly say, well, it's very pungent, it has, you know, the, uh, the, the pyrazine in there on decatrain, so yeah. it's very, very sharp. So she would have a memory of smelling the galbanum because of the pungency of the galban. Yeah. So, uh, not to Babylon. My question would be, and, and, and everything that you've said tonight, and all the questions I, this, this leads into it. As far as, uh, let's say, memory from, pleasurable memory from suntan, mm. are you sure it's the suntan and the memory of being on a beach with suntan, or is there something probably within the salicylates? Are there certain molecules that this the human genome uh, from a global standpoint, do we react well to certain mem from a memorable standpoint because we are human, or do we have to have an environmental or mm -hmm. a let's say a, a conception from experience to that molecule to say that this is good or this is bad? Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your mother and your experiments, and to also say, Jivodan did. Uh, as I'm aware, an uh, amazing um, project in, I think it was in Singapore, looking at um, old memories and scents and Alzheimer's and patients. And so it's amazing work that you've done. Could, could, could you just explain, just for those that don't yep. know that, yeah, so, that and, and they, they, you, so make the connection. So this is kind of, like, what are these, sort of these different companies that are doing this? Or different, yeah, we've had or? a good conversation. Thank you very much. No, I'm <laughs> so um, just to say that there's, it, so Givaudan did in the project several years ago, uh, looking at, um, as I recall, Alzheimer's uh, uh, um, patients and uh, designing scents that were um, sort of childhood scents uh, and then bringing them uh, to the um, Alzheimer's patients and creating um, fabulous uh, um, memory experiences and improving their lives, right? So it's just an amazing uh, project. And, as I'm aware, and I'm not a medical doctor, and, and neither am I a biochemist, um, nor have I done what you've done clearly with your mother, but um, my understanding of the literature is that there is work going on looking at um, not only uh, scent uh, loss in progression of Alzheimer's, for example, but how can scent um, experience slow down um, uh, Alzheimer's onset or even possibly reverse. And so that's kind of what you're getting to. So it's a really super interesting area. And I kind of put it in the context of this frontier biology work that's going on. I think it's going to take some years before we can really, some of the questions you asked about what's really going on when I smell suntan lotion, I don't think I can really answer that right now. But um, uh, there are answers. And but so but are they, just, just to get to the essence of what you're saying, are we actually experiencing something that's deep in our genome as a common human, we respond to that kind of smell, or is it environmental from your childhood or something that you had to experience? Do you have any thoughts on where that's tipping, one way or the other? I think it's both, and okay. I think it really depends. I mean, I'm pretty sure that suntan lotion experience is not coming from my genome, but there may be some elements of that suntan lotion that go back a really long way. So it's really both. And uh, it, it, uh, you know, come back to the rat experiment I, uh, experiment I described, and the and the roasted coffee being clearly they had no experience with coffee, and yet all of them had this higher endorphin level as a consequence of that experience. That's clearly a genetic effect. Fascinating. Okay, let's go back to here. Uh, uh. Thank you. I'm so excited. Um, could, could you identify yourself a little? You're back. My name is Kathy Lilly, and now I teach restorative yoga for Yoga Works, Sister Yoga, a number of places, but I actually was in the fragrance industry for three decades. Uh, I love this. Now, David, the first thing that comes to mind with all this conversation of scent loss um, is habituation. So have you encountered any of this with yeah. the um, minute amount? Yeah. And everyone knows what habituation is, right? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my second question, I, I'll put it out here, um, is also in terms of lavender, as you possibly know, um, research shows, and I believe even Memorial Sloan Kettering, our very own hospital system here, sorry about that, um, hormone-sensitive cancers, uh, went, people with that uh, exposed to lavender, there was a very weak estrogenic um, effect. And then lavender to people on, uh, what is it, CNS depressants, mm -hmm. anti-anxiety drugs might have the effects magnified. Cholesterol, like, are you looking into all that? Yeah, so, well, um, let me just say about the habituation. So one of the things that we're trying to do with this system is to have the scent not uh, endure very long, it's just a couple minutes, and then to move on. And so that's, we're precisely trying to avoid that. Um, you know, I think that, Really honestly, I think that the data, the biological data that exists today, that um, I, 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 there's clearly a lot of phenomenological data around lavender and, and other scents. Uh, and, and again, these major fragrance houses have incredible amounts of data. I think you have more data than you understand is what I've, I think it's incredible. But I think that the biological understanding of even the effects of lavender, I think are, we're far from really having a good understanding of that. And I, I the hypothesis, at least, that those I work with are making is not that lavender doesn't have an effect, but that the confounding effects of other phenotypical um, conditions um, make it sort of hard to measure. So you kind of intuitively understand your phenotype, and you know when lavender works for you, but it's kind of hard. Medicine doesn't really know that. So the clinical data, I think, right now are sort of um, up in the air, uh, is my understanding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now. Um, Okay, here, let's go back to this side and uh, get a question there. We're getting towards the end here, folks, so you can all have a whiff of scotch here shortly. <laughs> yeah, my name is Max. Uh, I'm in fashion tech, and I also was, was part of a lot of the launches in Christian Dior and Estee Lauder. And you touched upon something about characterology and scent and beauty and aesthetics. So I was trying to, and, and, and in the beauty market, everyone is trying to figure out the perfect scent for the perfect character, male or female, there's a distinction, and one of the ingredients that are using. So has there been any study in terms of mapping out these ingredients in terms of characterology? And the point is really not memory loss in the, and that part of what you were explaining, but more the empowerment of the person using the scent, what part of the brain is that, is that activated? So. I will provoke you a little bit here and say that I think where we are right now in scent, at least what I'm aware of, is, is a little bit like where we were um, 40 years ago in biology where there was a discovery of the structure of DNA and, and, and or even go back to the um, discovery of the human genome. In biology today, there's this recognition that it's all about movement. It's all about complex systems and exchange of information and evolu evolving conditions. So I think that the, the, the scent profile that you're describing has a kinetic um, nature, and it's also connected to who I am right now. I think that the male-female thing is helpful, but I think there's a whole phenotypical thing that has to do with the fact that I didn't sleep much last night or had an argument or whatever. So I think that where scent is going in this holy grail that you're describing is um, uh, much more of a merger with biology um, and, uh, um, and a, um, you're, you're entering into the, the, the life process itself. So I think that the, the, where scent needs to go, in my view, in the fragrance world, um, is into um, scents that are um, what I need for who I am right now. And, and uh, so that's not very helpful because I think there is more information on the, the, of the kind that you're just, but I think that you need to kind of step back, in my opinion, and look at this bigger arc. Are there notes that are generally accepted that men like, women like, or certain age groups, certain cultures, that these notes are accepted? I mean, that's it. They're, they're proven that these notes are proven, musk and male, or or white yeah. flowers and females. Yeah. Uh, you would uh, probably know better than me. And so well, I, uh, yeah. Okay, and I, so yeah. I was just thinking that possibly there is a correlation on a molecular level of the essence to that part of the, so, the so, human. So uh, again, my, my, the, the, just to say one more time, I, what I, I think that the answer to that question is going to um, 
involve an excursion, kind of leaving that question aside for a moment and going and looking at um, a much more profound relationship between my sensitivity to scent and my phenotype, and we probably will be able to integrate and make some general comments about, well, men generally <laughs> and women generally, whatever that means. Um, so, but I think we, we kind of are at that sort of interesting, dangerous moment where we kind of know too much to go back to exactly where we were before, and so we're, yeah. We're just getting very close to the end here, and I just want to say there's two observations as I'm hearing this. Is that one is, this is, what we're seeing here is, you know, someone from the fashion industry, someone from the health industry, someone from, you know, the perfume industry who's inside this smell space. What's interesting about these conversations in this network over time is the cross-disciplinary nature of the conversation as you kind of get stretched in different ways. The second thing that's interesting is you're, you kind of have two cents. You're a scientist and kind of in, in the kind of leading edge of what we know, and then you're also an entrepreneur in applications. And that's interesting to just hear how many of these questions were about the science and where it was going. And uh, not as many, actually, right now on the applied side of it, but maybe that's not representative. But I'm just interested when you think of yourself and those two sides. So I'm going to surprise you here. Okay, okay, okay. And I'm going to come back to actually a couple friends of mine who I've just met who are sitting over here, and I'm not going to kind of throw a light on them. But I think I view myself, I think there's a really, really interesting intermediate state between the discovery and the commercialization, and it has to do with culture. And it has to do with this conversation, really, that we're having right now, where nobody's really pretending to know all the answers, and nobody's really kind of trying to make a lot of money, but everybody's trying to figure out um, where the value is. And there's a conversation going on, which I think fundamentally is what culture does. So I view myself as, as, as being a, um, something between a scientist and an artist, and, and kind of most comfortable around um, people who are asking questions. So I love this conversation. Um, you know, as all of us, and it, these, this kind of uh, sandbox that I'm describing is not sustainable um, and, and not even valuable if it's not connected to the fundamental research on the one side and the translation and, and real commercial and, and cultural impact on the other side. So I, I'm involved in all of that, but I'm, I'm most home in, in, in this kind of a conversation. And when you, you said scientist, artist, yeah. Yeah, that's the continuum? So you don't think of yourself as an entrepreneur on the other end? I, mean, I don't is, really, is there, is no, that, I don't really wake up in the night kind of trying to figure out how can I uh, be successful with the company. I often think about, oh my God, how can I be successful with the company? But it's not really the, it's, I'm, I'm really driven by, and I think maybe many of you are, but I'm really driven by um, uh, discovery and, and, uh, and, uh, and the kind of sharing of that really with uh, those around me. And it's sort of this sort of self, discovery that I think cultural exchange involves. And I, I just want to point out that since the internet in the late 90s, that cultural exchange has been a cauldron of innovation uh, for changing how we live on the planet, right? So we, it, it, and, and we, by the way, do need to live pretty radically differently on the planet. And I think that will happen through a cultural exchange, which, as again, started with the internet. And um, I think that, um, and I'm, I, I can say I'm clearly not alone here. I think that increasingly artists, scientists, perfumers, uh, musicians, um, uh, engineers uh, are kind of finding that interesting um, cultural intermediate space. That's fascinating. So for final, given that we're at the end here, so when you think in a broader lessons of, for innovation, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying you really want to follow your curiosity first and you're kind of translate it later second kind of? I mean, is there kind of a, a, a hierarchy of yeah. kind of, yeah, I think of, of process here in, that goes towards innovation? If I can just pull this book up and just show, so there's this sort of um, circle that happens in creating and you see here, it and could, you see you it hold the mic there? And, yeah. and there's, uh, you can take the example of Silicon here. Valley and you've got Stanford, you've got, you know, where people are learning and then you've got this startup community where people are losing money and then you've got um, companies that are making money. And that um, tripartite uh, uh, structure of um, uh, innovation culture happens in, with Broadway, with New York University, off Broadway, Broadway. And so you generally have one area of value in your creative life where you're learning. And, and there's one area where you're just experimenting and kind of exchanging, kind of cultural exchange. And, and finally, where you're producing and selling a work of art or uh, an iPhone. So this, um, any very healthy uh, cultural community has all three things going on and in a circle. And some innovators are really good here, 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 and um, yeah, and so, but I'm involved in all of those things and, and, and I think that, um, 
yeah, the, the, the healthy cultural innovation uh, community that we uh, really need to confront the big problems and certainly figure out what scent can do for us is really requiring that triple um, uh, uh, merger of learning, experimentation, and uh, production. Perfect place to end, by the way. The book coming out is Creating Things That Matter, The Art and Science of Innovations That Last, coming out in October. Thank you. So let's give a great hand of applause for David. Really a, a wonderful conversation, a great example of, of what we should be doing here in this community over time. One thing I wanted to mention, folks, I watched some people were kind of holding their phones up live streaming on their own, which is totally cool. But I will say, we live stream this every time. It, you can find it off of reInvent's front page, where you could, uh, on his page that you talks about him, you get the live stream, the edit, the video will be there, highlights and everything else. And so just as a rule, just think about it. If you want to get it, the whole clean three camera shoot, you can always get it there. Uh, and finally, we welcome you guys to stay, have more drinks, something more to eat, and try out these things. They're awesome. And with that, let's, uh, let's have a good time. Thanks. Thank